So this is my core principles. Um, and this is something that I do, I try to do in every workshop that I teach. These are the things that have made the biggest difference in my teaching that I wish I had really known before. So I'm taking you know, my 21 years of Waldorf experience and kind of you know, boiling it all down to what are, what are the biggest things that I've learned along the way. The three-year plan is this. Whenever I'm teaching a big topic, I'm always thinking in the back of my head this. I have three years for this group of students to get good at this topic that I'm introducing right now. So maybe I'm teaching fractions in fourth grade. Maybe I'm doing long multiplication, introducing that in third grade. I'm just having in the back of my mind that I have three years for them to become really good at it. So look at algebra. So with algebra, I'm introducing it in a main lesson in seventh grade. I don't have to get them to a point of thinking that they are going to be, you know, that I'm done with it at all. Okay, this is the foundation. Then in eighth grade, I do a little more with algebra, deepen it a little bit more, review. And then it's really in ninth grade that it really becomes cemented. And, and it's in ninth grade that it, I'm really expecting mastery. This is when they're really going to penetrate algebra to the fullest. Same with percents. In seventh grade, we find ourselves in the middle of the percents thing. What do I mean by that? I'm introducing it in sixth grade. Seventh grade, a little bit more practice, but I'm not really expecting them to, to master percents until eighth grade. And do you see, if I start to think of things like this as a teacher, it takes off the pressure. Because I always used to think, whatever I'm teaching, doesn't matter what it is, you have a unit of something that you're teaching, I'm going to introduce it, they're going to practice it, and I'm going to test them on it, and they need to be good at it. And if I've taught it well, what happens? They'll never forget it. And that's totally wrong. There's no way that we can expect as teachers that we're going to introduce something, they practice it, they're going to master it, and they're never going to forget it. That doesn't happen. Right? And so the part of this three-year plan is this Wal Waldorf concept of sleep. So we introduce it. It gives a foundation, then what happens? It goes to sleep, right? And that's good. It's actually good for them to forget. There are some textbooks out there that are operating, in my opinion, on this myth that, that the student should never allow, be allowed to forget anything. If they forget, that's bad. And it's not bad. It's actually part of learning. So to forget, that's part of learning. And this is all woven into this three-year plan. We, we do something, it goes to sleep, they forget, we bring it back, they review it, and they're like, oh, now I remember how to do this. We go a little further, and then it goes to sleep again. And then the third time, we can then really then start to expect mastery. To a large degree, it's a balance between the two. And so we're always trying to figure, how can I balance skills with mathematical thinking? So let me ask you, think back to the time when you were in school, all the math classes you took over all the years. What percentage of the time do you think classroom time was spent on skills? What percentage of your math classroom time was spent on skills, do you figure, when you were in school? I mean, 98%. A lot of the topics, a lot of the math puzzles and all these things that help to develop mathematical thinking, we don't seem to have time for it because we have to focus on these skills that they absolutely need. And so that's one of the things I'm really questioning here. Right? We're given the impression as a teacher, aren't we, that our task is to just get through this giant list of stuff. And usually that giant list of stuff is completely overwhelming. It doesn't seem possible to get through it all. Right? And I think that's a myth as well. And so my goal here in general, if I just put it out here very loosely and not to become too attached to it, my goal is to really balance, have a 50-50 balance. So 50% of my time is really going to be spent focusing on skills, and 50% is what I call mathematical experiences. And some of those mathematical experiences help to develop mathematical thinking. So that's the second thing, is to really try to balance skills. And if I think of all the typical problems that we ever had on a math test, I would say your job, 
pretty much as a math, I mean, you tell me if I'm wrong, but as a math student, your job to come into the test was to look at the problem, to identify what kind of a problem it was and what procedure that you needed to implement to solve that problem. Does that sound accurate? If all we're doing in terms of our skills work is just going through one procedure after the other, then I think we're missing out of a big part of what math really is because we really want the real math is what involves mathematical thinking. And that oftentimes, again, gets neglected. And so is it clear what I mean by blind? If you're following a blind procedure, you don't know what you're doing. So I, I, I'll go as far to say that the train wreck happens in second grade. And what I mean by the train wreck is second grade is often the time when we're, we're telling students that this is what math is and it's a procedure. And it often starts with carrying and borrowing. You know, suddenly in, in second grade, people may be adding things like this, or they may be subtracting problems like this, and they're writing it vertically. And a problem like this suddenly has a procedure attached with it, and the students don't really understand why it works. This is the beginning of when math becomes a list of procedures. And I would go as far to say that for most people, their experience when they were a student is that math is a list of blind procedures to be memorized to apply to meaningless problems. I mean, that's sort of my sound bite. This is what I go around. I, I now like to think of myself as a math missionary. and We're trying to save math from meaninglessness. And that's what we're trying to fight against. Because suddenly this, this should not have to be a vertical procedure, should it? We should be able to, do, we should be able to think through this. Even our second graders should be able to do something like this, not written like this, but instead written like this. This feels different, doesn't it? We need to make sure that we teach math in a way that math is not rigid. It should not be this rigid, fixed thing. We want to minimize this. Should we ever teach carrying and borrowing? Of course, but not in second grade. You know, we want to delay that until third grade for sure. And the second graders need to look at this, and they really need to think it through. And this is what mathematical thinking is in second grade. Right? It's all tied into this developing a sense of number and so I think what ends up happening is these blind procedures come about. And of course, the second grader doesn't know any better. They think this is what math is. And then in third grade, they get long multiplication and often long division. And I wouldn't do long division really until the end of fourth grade, right? There's no reason to bring it in by then. And then in fourth grade, suddenly they're doing fractions and they're doing complicated fraction work. And again, more procedures, more blind procedures. They don't understand really what they're doing. For me as a teacher, I have this idea, sort of in the back of my mind, I always have this idea, if I start to introduce something as a blind procedure, I ask myself, is this a blind procedure? And if it is, then I ask myself, is there a way to do it differently? Is there a way that I could teach this so that there's understanding involved as a procedure? Is there a way to do that? And oftentimes, almost always there is. And what's the ultimate blind procedure typically? What do you think the ultimate blind procedure is? Isn't it long division, right? And so I, I know because I've done this in fourth grade, gone in with the class and taught them long division so it comes out of understanding. So we're really always considering how is what I'm bringing to the students right now going to affect the students in terms of their development. It's very important. So more than anything, I'd say that this, this influence is certainly how we bring a lesson for the day. We think about how am I going to do that that's going to work for the students before me. I give you an example. I'll show you a proof a little bit later of the fact that uh, the angles inside of a triangle add to 180. How am I going to present that? It's going to be very different when I do that for a seventh grade class than when I do it for a 10th grade class because they're developmentally in a very different place. Right? So there's one example. How I bring something is going to be different. And the other thing where this comes up is when I bring it.
So the question is not how quickly and how young can I bring this to my students? But the question becomes, when is the best time for them developmentally to really to encounter this topic? And oftentimes, if I wait until they're truly ready and they're ripe to receive this, then if I really wait to the right moment, what I find, and I've found this time and time again, that when I teach something later than I used to, I find that it's much easier for them. Right? And I can teach it in much less time, and they can really understand it more deeply. And it's more valuable for that reason. The important thing is the life lessons that they learned by doing the math. And if I can really help my students to transform struggle into success, then I know I've done something. So when a parent comes to me and said that my child struggles with math, then what I'm fond of saying is, well, they now have the possibility for the greatest success. Because let's face it, if you went through the whole year of math and you never had any struggles, yeah, it was a good year for you. Okay, it's good that you, you learned all of this stuff. Maybe you had some fun with it. Maybe your thinking developed. All that's good. But it's far better if in the process that you encountered struggle, and you worked through that and felt successful. That's the ultimate success. I sometimes worry about the students that everything is easy for them. Okay, then I'm gonna specifically work on finding something that will challenge them. All of our students, all of our students need to have challenge. We need to challenge all of them. Now, in a great appropriate way, I would argue, in a developmentally appropriate way, I would argue that it's not good to challenge them by just moving them several years ahead. Right? That's not going to really accomplish anything. You want to make sure that you're, that, that, you're, that you're planting questions as seeds in the students. They think about them for a while. They struggle with it. And then, and then you guide them to discovering the answers themselves. That's different, isn't it? And that's the sort of thing that we really want to look for opportunities to do. How am I going to create and cultivate and grow a question that lives within the students in my class? How am I going to do that in an artful way such that two or three weeks later, we all come to this realization of what the answer is? And immediately when I say that to my seventh graders, they're, they're intrigued. They're like, wow, yeah, how could you do that? I have no idea. And you build it up as this is something that we're going to be spending now three or four weeks doing to get to the point where we can take the square root of this giant number. And you write the giant number sort of up on the board or something like that, and it sits there the whole time. And then we finally get to the point where we can do that. Do you see? So there was a huge question that they had no idea how they could possibly do it. And it lived within them. And finally, we get to the point to do that.